Hi and welcome to Matrix Moments. This is Saloni and on today's episode we dive deep into PhonePay's journey. Bikram Vaidyanathan, managing director at Matrix Partners India, has an unfiltered conversation with Sameer Nigam, co-founder and CEO at PhonePay. They talk about what it takes to build one of India's leading digital payments platform from Sameer's early days at Flipkart to starting and building PhonePay and then selling to Flipkart. They cover all of this and more. Tune in. Guys, thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, pretty special podcast. Uh, huge welcome to Sameer Nigam, uh, who needs no introduction. And Sameer, thank you for doing this for us, but I'm going to introduce you anyway. Uh, and I was going back uh, and looking at your LinkedIn, which I haven't done in a long time. But I went and looked at your link, LinkedIn and it said Flipkart, PhonePay, what an ad. And, 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 but it is actually amazing that those are the big chunks of your life and you've actually been at this for for, for a while uh, mumbai born and bred ended up at wharton started a bunch of companies uh, as a uh, and that's probably less known as a serial entrepreneur sold a company to flipkart and that's how you ended up at flipkart and then it's just been a fantastic journey both at flipkart then starting at starting phone pay and then being still part of the flipkart mothership but doing your own own thing it's just been a fantastic journey to watch and thank you for joining us on this. Thanks, Vikram. Always a pleasure. So, Samir, I'm going to take you back to the old, old days and circa, you know, 12, 13, 14 uh, on the Flipkart floor, as you guys used to call it. And, you know, all the people who ran that floor, right? You, Chari, uh, Mukesh, and uh, Ankit, the, the Udan guys, there is so much talent there, which then led to huge companies. So talk a little bit about that floor, what made it special? What were your learnings from there? Yeah, I think I think it's one of the most uh, exciting parts of my career till date. I, I think uh, anyone who was there in those days, they were equal parts heavy, equal parts just stressful, just because I, th I think Flipkart was really a um, bunch of very, very sharp, young people who came together and then over the years added some incredible sort of seasoned talent as I may. Um, and, and I think the one thing that really stood out for me with that company and started with such an envy was just open-ended ambition. Um, we were working in a small startup, Rahul and myself, my co-founder in Bombay at the time. We were working in the music industry and uh, learned the very hard way you don't make money in the music industry easily. Um, but we met up with Vinny and Amol and uh, Mekin, uh, part of the very early team. And we met for half a day. We shook hands. We kind of moved in and then completed the deal paperwork ages later. Um, because what we, what we were just really excited by was a bunch of folks that were saying, customer and technology first, everything else will follow. They literally didn't have a business plan. I think most of the leadership team honestly didn't even know what a PNL looked like at that point. But they had very, very bold uh, missions. Around that time, in fact, I'll give you two quick anecdotes to give you a sense for why people thought big at that place. When we met Vinny the first time, there was a rumor that Amazon might be buying Flipkart for seven, eight hundred million. So when we when we asked him about whether they're likely to sell, his response was, I'm in my mid-20s. By the time I'm done, people should be asking us if you're buying Amazon. That's the way I want to think about this, right? We're like, that is just, that's just amazingly bold and amazingly sort of crazy at the same time. Then we met Sachin. And again, this is 2011, 10, 11. Uh, and he spent half an hour on a whiteboard walking Burzin, Rahul, and myself, the three co-founders, through his argument for why e-commerce will be a 25 to $30 billion business by 2020. This is 2011. People are still not over the hump of actually paying online and why Flipkart could be a $20 billion company by then. And again, I, I remember leaving that meeting and Burzin, who's almost a decade older than the two of us, looked at us and said, either these guys are just batshit crazy or they're just going to change the world and I think we should join, right? I mean, I think that outlook uh, on life, taking a 20, 30, 40 of you when you're in your mid twenties, I haven't seen that often in entrepreneurs. Just really hard to imagine what life will be like when you're twice your age. And being able to say within that, that 
we will conquer the world no matter what. Uh, and that was true with Sujit and more than a lot of the guys uh, we joined in 2011. And I think it became very, very um, indoctrinated in the culture of that place. Obviously, success helps. But even in the, in the down cycles that every company goes to them, I think the perseverance was there. And I think you see that now with all of the entrepreneurs that have come out of that place, not just entrepreneurs, CEOs. Uh, maybe there's, there's hardly anyone I know who comes out of that company, even today, with Anand startup and Nishant Verman and Vikas Bansal and that, and that leadership brand today, who comes out and says, I want to work for someone, I want to do something incremental. Everyone comes out and says, let me identify a really large opportunity and try and sort of change the market. I think, I think that is really, really sort of been, um, and I think it, it shaped a lot of our decisioning at Phone Bay in the early days. So the one thing that struck me about that time was all of you guys played so many roles. I think you played, I don't know, five, six roles, growth, engineering, product. And uh, when I go through most people's trajectory within Flipkart at that time, everybody played so many roles. What made that work and how did it shape each of, each of you guys? So I think the shaping is easier, right? I think just that exposure at, at that scale, when you're doing 10x a year over a four, five year window, I think that exposure helped all of our careers. There, there's no question about it. I think everyone becomes a much more uh, seasoned entrepreneur when you come out. Because as an entrepreneur, you're, you're basically out there, you don't really function, right? You're a lawyer and a marketer and a, and a copywriter and you're a coder. Uh, so it helped a lot of us. Um, I think why it worked well was if you see that team uh, one level below Sachin and Vinny, a lot of folks had a very, very strong either tech background or business background or both. And I think we had, a, we had the right combination of mix of those. So either people were just so young that they didn't know better and they said, well, we're just going to make it happen. And that's just the entire, entire founding team there at that company was all IIT. And so they were just very, very analytically sharp. Whether they were in the tech functions like Anamod or whether they were people like Sujit. Uh, or there were people on the business side, again, who didn't know what failing looks like because they were just too young. So I think we felt comfortable saying this is the biggest set of problems to be solved over the next 8, 12 or 18 months. And the founders, I think, put trust in the leadership team saying, we'll put the smartest people available at this point of time on those problems. We figured it out as we went. You know, one of the things that always uh, strikes me when I talk to you is that you know, you're playing the orchestra, right? And I think you've been phenomenal at both choosing the orchestra and then sort of making it hum. And so I'm going to uh, start on that thread, which is you, Chari Burzin, and it's sort of, you've been joined at the hip since, I don't know, for forever. Uh, what, and I, I guess it was an obvious choice for you in some ways to say, hey, I'm leaving Flipkart and I'm going to start up again and it's going to be the three of us again. So one, you know, was, was that an automatic choice because you had so many other others from Flipkart you could join? Why was that an automatic choice? And what makes it work for the three of you? So I think the two of them was an automatic choice. Uh, I, I sorry, did... sorry, Sami, just pa pause there but and talk a little bit about you, Burzin, Chari, and you know, when, yeah. when you guys met and how did you guys start? Yeah, so I was just saying that I think given how, how long we've known each other, Chari and I went to undergrad in Bombay. So we've known each other since, well, 1995. So it's, it's 26 years now. Um, our, his wife was a junior of ours in college. So, I mean, literally the families have, have known each other. We were roommates in Arizona. Um, and so I think that one was just very, very easy, right? I think we know each other for so long that we know that value system thinking like thought process, strategic thought process, and uh, trust, you can just take for granted. Just absolutely like in my eyes, with my eyes closed, if there's anything that we need to sort of take a call on, on these aspects, how do we treat employees? How do we treat partners? What kind of company are we going to build? And whether it's going to be technology led or not, I think having the luxury of having three founders where anyone can answer that on behalf of the others, Literally, we complete our sentences, it's huge. Burzin and I met uh, when I just started out my career in Los Angeles. So that was again, 2000, 2001. So it's been 20 years, right? So we've, we've gone through a lot 
Um, in our first venture when we started out, we were we were all first time entrepreneurs. Um, we again decided to build an iTunes like platform for India. We knew nothing about the Indian market. We were all three in the states. We knew nothing about the music industry, but we were having a ton of fun building. Uh, and I think I think we enjoyed working with each other so much that starting up again was a no brainer. I think where ten years of the, the entrepreneurial journey and especially the Flipkart stint helped us was identifying much larger markets. One learning with the music industry was if the size of the pie is big enough, the proverbial size of the pie is big enough, you can meander around and strike gold. Uh, second was we're much better at building large scale platforms and we enjoyed a lot more as, as technologists. Building large scale, massy, uh, high social impact platforms and building great experiences. If I was building, an iTunes like player again, I would have gone to a Mukesh Bansal. I think he's the best branding like I've met in the country in this space. And just look at what he's done with Cult. I mean, he's made sweating feel cool, right? Um, if we were trying to actually build a very, very large supply chain kind of a company, I would have gone to people like Sujit and Bevel Gupta and others at Oran and look at what they're doing there. Uh, when we decided that we're moving on from Flip and we're going to start over, we were very clear that we want to build something which has technology, not as the enabling function, but as the reason for existence, right? So Burzin and, and Rahul, I think were automatic calls. Uh, I did talk to Amol. Uh, I think he's one of the most fertile thinkers I've met in my life in the technology sphere again. Uh, but again, I think he uh, decided to pursue venture at the venture with Oran, uh, or the venture with Sujit and VG that eventually became Oran. But those were the only three people I could think of. Um, I think I think a lot of others who were in that team at Flipkart, we'd also gone through this combustion engine, right? We knew so much about each other. Uh, we'd gone through adversity, we'd gone through upside. We knew where the DNA match was the highest and the comfort level was the highest. But I felt that for what we want to do next, I wanted pure play technologists at the helm. So that was the, the founding team. Uh, so, so, Samir, I'm going to pause you there and just sort of highlight a few things for our listeners. So first, you know, we always say that uh, the best co-founders are found in shared history. And for you guys, that's just like so true. But the two things that you talked about, which is values and trust, and they're a bit inter interrelated. And often young founders don't think about it enough, right? Is is my value system the same? And would I trust this person to behave the same way and make the same decisions, even if they are far away? And for people who don't know, Burzin is in the US most of the time, and you guys just have this implicit uh, trust uh, between between you guys and the so fantastic. Thing. And the second thing, which is tech as the reason for existence. And now when you say it, I remember our uh, conversation and you really wanted to get back to those tech roots and then chose people who had that, as their core, which is the tech as the reason for existence. Um, and thinking very sharply about this is the DNA that I want, common DNA that I wanted every single person at the beginning uh, is another thing that founders uh, underestimate. And I just want to talk about the rest of the team because you've pre preserved that DNA and maybe not tech as the core, but there is, you know, when you meet a phone pay person, you know it's a phone pay person and you've got pretty low churn. There's a reason that people stick and love working at phone pay. What is that? I, I do believe actually it does go back at the core to value tech and trust. Uh, allow me a minute to actually sort of delve into that further. When I, when I said values and trust separately, there's a reason for it. I think too many founders, young, young folks confuse bonding with trust. When you're building an organization, we keep saying this at phone pay and down also. Trust means nothing. Transparency is everything. And again, I think something that we invite very early on, uh, it's still my CFO's nightmare. But since the first month when we launched, we told all employees, we will always, 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 unless the securities exchange prevents us, show the entire MIS and PNL of the company to all employees simultaneously. We do it every month, we're five years old. So everyone at Phone Bay who's working there sees the EBITDA, sees the FCF. We have designers come and ask us things like, 
how does the monetization work? It's amazing. It's amazing when that doesn't get leaked, at least till now it hasn't, right? And it's a long-standing trust model with the finance team and the legal team saying, until that trust is betrayed, we will always persevere. Now, there will come a time when somebody might actually betray that trust. But I genuinely believe if you operate in a model where the transparency is super high, most human beings, most of the time, will never betray that trust. And I think that's, that's what I meant by our trust model. Uh, that's at the corporate level, really, in terms of the culture we wanted to build. If you aren't learning, then you're just working for us. And if you're an employee, you'll just find the best employee. We want to make it a lot more participative. We want to, we want to make sure that 10 years later, when people talk about us, like we were at Flipkart, people say, if you were at PhonePay, you've got such tremendous grounding that you can do anything because you've learned a lot, right? We were lucky at Flip. Uh, Vinny and Sachin started that, and we all sort of followed through on that, that promise of providing tremendous learning. Uh, you, you hear of companies like Levers and others just institutionalize this, right? So I think, I think the flavor of trust is important. Values is at a personal level. Values are about, will you, will you preserve short-term cash or will you actually retain all your employees during COVID? Will you pay their salaries and their bonuses? And will you do all the right things? And, and will you try and provide oxygen? Um, so you asked me, the, and now answering your question on why people still stay. I think, I think it's a model of reciprocity and, and mutual respect. And God knows I have a temper, you know that. Um, we, we fight and we argue like cats and dogs on product, but it's never personal. And I think, I think that's important. That distinction between this is the right thing for the consumer or this is the wrong thing for the consumer versus you are an idiot or not. I think it's very important that entrepreneurs understand you'll set not just the product vision will set the culture in the first year or two. And so if you have people that are just listening to you and they're hierarchical, the culture is dead because no one's going to speak up. But if you have a model where you're just polite to people and you're not willing to challenge ideas, you are also dead because then the business won't go. And I think striking that balance, I, I like to believe the first 50 to 100 people we got, well, a lot of them in the leadership roles today, uh, share that. That's how we handpick talent. That's why we identified who belongs and doesn't. It wasn't on pure tech jobs or business jobs. It was, do you have the temerity to say, no, I disagree regardless of rank or file? Do you have a fertile enough brain where those ideas matter? I don't want to hear uh, really dumb ideas all the time just to be democratic about it. I want really smart people, but I want people to be fearless. Yeah. No, I, and you know, when you articulate this thing about transparency, uh, Actually, full disclaimer, my wife works for Samir. So, uh, and married she's up. Been, yeah, I've definitely married up and you keep reminding me that. So, uh, and I was asking her, I said, I'm going to do this podcast with Samir. What, what is common to Samir, Rahul and Burzin? And her fat answer was, they're very direct and they're very transparent. And, and you will always know uh, where they stand, right? And what you see is what you get. And I think your team is actually pretty mature and you didn't hire like, you did hire freshers later, but in the in the beginning, you hired pretty mature individuals, and they all appreciated the what you see is what you get, and you know the fact that it was respectful disagreements about issues versus disagreements about people, and I think that's been uh, fantastic to see. Uh, I want to switch gears on UPI and uh, take you back to those times when you know uh, between NPCI, I Spirit, there used to be these. UPI sandbox conferences where we used to, people were tinkering around trying to build something on the back of UPI and it was like 15, 20 people who, are, who had been dragged into a room saying, why don't you think about UPI? And you were there at, at Ground Zero, right? Yeah. Uh, and actually we reconnected ar around some of that. What made you believe at that point in time? And you had like sheer belief, man, that yeah. this would be the thing that's going to change everything. So what made you believe that? So when there's, when there's a massive, as they say, a Delta force change coming, right? If I look at lead indicators in a space that's heavily regulated, by the way, very important to see who's driving the change. On that particular one, we were looking at working with a bunch of the big banks on IMPs, building that brokering layer that eventually actually UPI itself is. 
And we realized that there's, we don't have a prayer because like any other market in the world, the Indian banking system is so strong that self-disruption for the larger good won't happen. So IMPS was looking tough. The rails were there, but you'd have to do a lot of work to convince partners. When UBI was, uh, the first hackathon that we heard, uh, I think you were also there. We heard Mr. Nilekani, we heard Pramod Varma, uh, we heard Sanjay Jain and Sharad Sharma. But by the way, I think what tipped it for us in that first meeting itself was the fact that the regulator was very, very excited. NPCI was very, very excited about the chances. And we saw at least two or three big banks having said, we are in already. Access and ICIC, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> so you had a few big banks willing to take the bet. Uh, and then the RBI sort of uh, sound bite started coming, Mr. Rajan. And he said, we're going to change the way payments happens. And then we started hearing the government is getting excited about this. I think by the time we were two or three months in, two things were certain. There's going to be a legit shot at this happening. Now, everyone we spoke to, and, and I remember you all talking to people, when all the banks was telling us this will never happen, and everyone around them that actually can, can influence strategy and, and policy was saying this is happening, for me, that's, that's a punt worth taking. Because what, it's almost like crypto, for example. I would not enter, and I, I still won't enter the crypto market if it is not central bank bank. But if the Reserve Bank said, we are going to launch a central bank back, crypto, and everyone said, nobody to adopt crypto, like you're nuts. And I'd start for Bay 2.0 tomorrow right now, right? So I think, I think the enabling factors were there. The second thing, and the reason I think we fancied our chances was just plainly put stage of life. Raul and myself were knocking on 40, Burzum was knocking on 50. We tasted some success in our previous ventures. We had the luxury of taking that 1% fund for a very, very large outside opportunity. Like we, we could afford to. We could afford to fail. We knew what it looked like. But it was going for broke in, in some sense. Yeah, absolutely going for broke, right? I mean, you're doing it on a promise. And if you remember when, when UPI launched, SBI, HDFC, Bank of Baroda, Kota, everyone was still poo-pooing it, saying, yeah, not really happening. It's it, Demon carried it. The Prime Minister carried it. The Beam app naming carried it. So... You go for broke. When you can afford to, yeah. you should go for broke. So the one other thing, and we'll come back to Demon, uh, is at that point of time, uh, you were imagining the future in a way that others weren't, right? I, I, and I remember one seminal whiteboarding session where you were talking about money, um, money transfers as easy as messaging, right? And it it needs to be integrated with messaging. And now it's a reality. Everybody, that's how you do it. You send money, text right there. And it is fully integrated. What I'm trying to decipher for early founders: How do you get that kind of consumer insight? Did you were you sort of immersing yourself in what consumers were doing? What was that aha moment? So uh, there were two parts to how we arrived there. One was experience. The second was insight. Right? The experience we'd had at Flipkart with things like the Big Billion Day, where the payment rails were just falling apart with the fact that while e-commerce had taken off, 70% of people were still choosing cash on delivery because two-factor authentication with OTP and God knows what else was just such a nightmare. And, and I think the last thing that needs to work was, you remember Jandan Man was going on that time, 120 yeah. million accounts getting added a year, but nobody was using net banking. It just told you that disruption is a must. What's happening today can't take us to sort of, the, the future will have to look different if payments will take off. So it's a problem to be solved at scale. In terms of the opportunity, it was actually much simpler. When I look at the, just technology trends and consumer behavior for the last 25 years, ever since the internet came along, 10, 15, 20 players in any market at any time have gotten together and said, this sector is never going to look the same five years later. It's happened in ticketing, which was an obvious. It happened in, because you never want to go and stand in a line. What's the upside of standing in a long line at a railway station or an airport? Change completely. Concerts, movie theaters, shopping. Shopping was more complex. That's why e-commerce adoption is still sub 20% in most markets. But 
in any sector where the goods or services being exchanged between two parties are not are not in question and money is the easiest i give you money you give me money money is money the, the flavor of money is not changing that transaction technology has to completely irreversibly just simplify uh, and for us in india given the mobile phone penetration given the data penetration and given how small the commerce e-commerce base was 100 150 million people 5 years ago remember everyone was investing in startups saying the market will open up geo and adel said the data has opened up and there was this vacuum in between and we just felt that if a brokering layer is connecting 100 banks without me putting in that effort as long as i can build a mind blowing interface and keep it really simple i have an opportunity to run the population and say a billion people can pay, make payments using an app so that opportunity is very very rare but it was very clear consumers would want it if you can deliver it so i think i think that's the way to think about it so going back to demon and now covid and uh, you know the not the, the best events in most people's lives but they were big big events for india payments so let's say some of these things didn't happen would we be still here where consumer payments is ubiquitous and it's a full blown full product we had to push people to use digital payments not very long ago i think without demon the urgency for people to find an alternative to cash for money transfer and salary remittances would not have happened and without that the forcing function for the government and particularly the prime minister and niti aayog and a lot of people putting their their name and face behind beam upi is safe the trust would not have come that early that there is there's no amount of there's no amount of money that can buy that kind of trust building by the government and that kind of a forcing function so i believe without demon digital payments in india would have looked very very different probably upi may never have become a complete story there there was just so much tug and pull that the that the banks may have prevailed in slowing things down i think covid is a different story i actually do believe covid is not the accident that people believe it is i think covid's made digital payments permanent it has not opened up the market further right. um and and my reason for saying that is we are looking at the offline market right that's the best measure of whether covid had an impact because now you are at home the offline transactions with us absolutely exploding income and 80% of transactions were already peer to and beyond so it was already very clear that digital payments will grow from here in fact covid limited the ability of a lot of us to advertise on masi platforms like ipl uh covid limited the number of use cases we could offer so i think i think it's made it it's limited the consumer adoption it has strengthened the per capita transaction volume those who are using are are never going back but those who should be using i think they are moving slower than we could i actually think it's a bit of both and you obviously have have the data to back uh, what you're saying but for sure it has just come up in your wallet right in terms of your own transaction stack it just essentially the number one option yeah. to to pay for for anything uh, which wasn't the case uh, but i also think a lot of people who are using it one off for one transaction suddenly are using it yeah. like this has become on the first screen of of your phone um moving on to one big decision that you made very early uh, you know lots of investors were chasing you me me included and hopefully ahead of the pack uh, and uh, you chose to sell to uh, to flipkart uh, you had all the money at your doorstep but you chose to go back to flipkart what sort of drove that decision yeah it was one of the hardest ones in life uh, it it came down to the following i think we had we had an incredible set of investors knock on wood leading and you guys were leading there um uh, you guys were were willing to put faith behind us or in us there was novas i remember there was a few others i think it came down to the following it came down again to just core motivation on day 0 when we started out rahul had said i am just so tired from the kutka journey as exhilarating as it one uh, was i want to build a really really small team and do something like whatsapp they just now they exist right 20 30 people no more than 100 in the company that was his his uh, sort of holy cow but 
he was as excited, if not more excited, by financial inclusion and financial services, even beyond payments at the time. So when we looked at what he wanted to do and what I wanted to do, I wanted to build an app store and I wanted to build a bunch of other stuff. Even then, you'd remember that. You guys are like, these guys are nuts. Um, I wanted to build a mobile browser. I wanted to build a bunch of stuff. Payments was the common leg. Now, once we, are, once we agreed on payments, and this is while we were talking to all of you, there was Paytm and Free Charge and all these other guys, and they were raising bucket loads of money, particularly I think Paytm at the time. And I think what became very apparent to us was we are taking a, there's a 1% an, an probability that UBI succeed. So the odds already stacked up against us. But if that 1% happens, if we aren't first to market and we can't really blitz from there with a deep capital watch as it won't work. Now, the investors we had would have backed us on the capital, but the threats needed to be out of the way, at least a bunch of them. Flipkart, on the other hand, was a very, very interesting proposition. Vinny had come again as CEO. We knew each other well enough over all these years where I think, I think he knew and the board knew that we would go for broke and we would go for scale. Uh, we were transparent about the fact that we're going for broke, but they knew that we'd go for scale right after. We wouldn't hold back. So that alignment was there. And when Vinny told us, we'll let you run completely independently and the culture is different, I, I think that was that was it, right? That was sacred to us. I, I think we passed the age in life where we're willing to inherit culture and not build it our way. I, I always uh, think it was a very special situation because if it wasn't you and Chari and Bozin who were actually Flipkart insiders and loved Flipkart, yeah. uh, I don't think anyone else would have done that decision. And second, I think it was a pretty big deal. If it wasn't actually the people that were there on the other side, who knew you guys would take such a big bet, it wouldn't have happened. So I think it was just one of those things that magically came together and it's just one a special situation. So I don't know if there is that much to learn for other founders from it, but I do think there's a big learning for founders from it in how you structured it to make sure that you stay independent, run it independently, or independent capital, all culture was independent. So talk a little bit about that for founders who are sure. maybe thinking about potentially selling, but are worried about whether they will pursue their dream or they, whether they will be allowed to pursue their dream in an independent fashion. So today at our scale, we also talk to a lot of founders, right? About potential active hires, acquisitions, et cetera. I think two learnings that I had during that whole episode. One, I think founders really need to understand whether they're trying to merge with, with a larger sort of uh, company because they want an exit or because they want a space where they can incubate what they were working on. Is it safe harbor or is it an end state? If it's an end state, don't, don't fool yourself. The party that's buying you is clear about why they're buying you is either for talent or for some IT, but they want to they have a point of view. In our case, because UPI didn't even exist and because Pay, uh, sorry, Flipkart didn't have a payments arm as such. Uh, it was easy. Vinny was looking at what's happening in payments and said, I think this group deserves to have a play in payments. It's going to be huge. I would like for you guys to incubate it independently. So it's easy. So be, first, you need to be very transparent about what you're looking for as the seller before the buyer can actually sort of make a point of view. Don't, don't fool yourself. I did that in my first venture with Vinny, I remember. Uh, we had this we had this really cool platform that was powering Ghana and Bingana and a bunch of startups. It made no money. We were just married to the IP. We were just having fun. And then he told us, I will not stop you. You decide one month after we launch flight if you still want to be doing this. And in a month, we'd, we'd done more downloads on the B2C side than we'd done in three years on the other side. And we're like, yeah, why are we wasting our time? Right? It's a hard learning. It's very hard to give up on your dream and, and merge it with another. So I think that's one clear learning. I think the second one, if you are, particularly if you want to incubate what you're doing, model it like a startup, then don't demand parity on salary and, and having all the perks of a large 10, 15, 20 million dollar company. Be scrappy. Uh, you, again, you'd remember this. We continued working in this really, really dingy office outside of HSR. We couldn't, we didn't have car parking. People would come in and deflate the tires. Uh, the village there. Uh, we structured the, the cash commitment over a three-year committed model based on targets. So our upside was linked to delivery. All the risk was ours. The upside 
was higher than the average person at Flipkart if we delivered. So we managed to structure it in line with how their board, us, many, everyone wanted to actually operate this. That I think is easier said than done. In most cases, we knew people there. So you're right. I think we got to cheat a bit. Everyone knew each other. Uh, that's just a fantastic story. And uh, you should uh, tell it a lot more. I'm going to move gears to payments and payments evolution. And this is going to end in a fight. Uh, but I'm going to go there anyway. So start uh, with uh, this, which is, do you think we've, uh, we've essentially driven payments penetration at the expense of the business model? And I'm just saying we collectively, yeah. all of us. Uh, and is that sustainable? I think, I, I know where you're going with that. To me, I think there are serious question marks on the UPI model, if that's where you're going. I've said this before, so I've, I don't think I can pretend that I haven't. Um, I think the zero MDR policy is a bad idea. I think it's a bad idea for two reasons. One, any industry at its nascency, trying to drive a change in consumer behavior requires a lot of investment. This has been true even in the offline world for decades. You used to have coupons and cashbacks and discounts in the physical stores. I mean, you're talking about the digital world now. Uh, it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of marketing. It takes a lot of building trust and fraud systems and tremendous IP. And God knows engineers are super expensive today. You know this yeah. better than most. Uh, so to not have a clear revenue model and an incentive for entrepreneurs means you're, you're forcing people to make unnatural choices. Early stage entrepreneurs are not entering the payments market in a way I would have loved to see. People often tell us, well, you use marketing. Well, I had the opportunity. I sold my company. I didn't have a single share in my company. That's what it cost. But that's one in a million people, right? We were just in a different stage of life. If we raised capital from you guys at Matrix and come and told you, I want to spend a billion dollars doing it for social good, but we won't ever make money. Yeah. I know which door you chose, right? And I think, I think that's a really bad subtle choice that they've made. That's one. Second, I never lose sight of the fact that we are all building the application layer and core platform leg, but money movements happening through the banks. And I think this notion that somehow you can disrupt how money payments are happening and also disrupt the business model and the investment model of the banking system below it and, and weaken it, I think is, is fool's paradise. There's, it's like trying it's like trying to tell Geo and Airtel and Vodafone and all these telcos. We want a tower at every square, square kilometer in India. We want you to pay for Spectrum. We want everyone to have 5G. And by the way, you'll never make a penny because we gave you Spectrum yeah. cheap. Yeah, that doesn't work. And, you know, this is the one maybe uh, that gets me, which is every we're probably ahead of every country in the world yes. with our payment system. Uh, but every country in the world uh, affords a payments company to make money on their core business model. And that allows for investments in, like you said, infrastructure, fraud, security. Uh, and right now we are trusting uh, the payments companies with uh, a lot of our data. And unless we provide a business model collectively as a country, I just don't think payments innovation will happen. And I think you touched upon a very important topic, which is young founders are not starting up in payments. And so they're going to drive a lot of the innovation. And unless there's a core business model, I just don't think that that will happen. And I know uh, you, you have a pretty loud voice and I'm hoping some of that voice actually gets uh, gets through. Uh, switching gears, right? But to this often used phase, which is, it's fine. Uh, you can't make money on uh, payments, but you can make money on data monetization. And uh, so what do you think about that? See, that one's interesting. I think, I think, there is some merit to it. Uh, I think payments data is the gold standard of, of data, right? And I think to that end, the fact that the payments market is opening up so fast is helpful. I think that data if harnessed well can un unlock a lot of value in the financial services that are just adjacent. Again, the problem is with how the ecosystem is shaping up. The banks are the custodians of the data as the sponsors in this model of UBI, but they don't have a relationship with the consumers that are not banking with them today. So you may have a lot of money movement, transaction movement, et cetera, 
but you are invisible to the customer. On the other side, companies like us, if we can't make money of payments directly, we have to use that data and try and figure out alternate business models around it. Now, where's the trust at? The trust is highest with the banking system. Then it goes on to the insurance, et cetera, and then to the fintechs. I mean, that's, and, and I think that's correct. Just the tech, tech behemoths of the world haven't done a very good job on the privacy front. Now, on the one side, regulation is coming in, and again, correctly so, limiting the amount of data abuse that is happening in terms of the capturing of it. On the other side, you're, you're creating perverse incentive to capture and exploit and monetize that same data. So I think that friction won't expose itself today, by the way. I think it's looming. It's going to come up in the next about 24 months because at some point, the data privacy bill will go through. At some point, this very unique non-personal data privacy act will go through, which is saying that your and my data uh, is public goods. And companies like us will get squeezed right in the middle. We'll get squeezed because we're sitting on a copious amount of data. We could capture a lot more and upset the customer but open up the, the financial inclusion agenda, or we could clamp down on the data, be more Appleist, be right, do right by customers on the data side, and then forego any ability to monetize. And therein lies the conundrum. Yeah. Well, I, I, did, I think I had two things. One, uh, I don't like the phrase data monetization, right? Because that inherently is just like a wrong term that you're taking my data and you're monetizing it, and that's your core business model that can't just can't exist. But I, if you also go back to maybe the more, um, um, you know, the early days where everyone had uh, rose tinted glasses on what this could be, one of the core principles was that the data uh, or the choice of sharing one's data would reside with the user. And I think as we sort of put people like yourself in a position where, you know, the only way to monetize is to create something from the data, the the user no longer actually has a choice or no longer has control. And I think that was fundamentally core to the, this entire system getting designed by the initial mm -hmm. architects, Promo, and everyone else, and including you guys, right? And do you feel like that this is just, a, is just taking away from that early goal where the user had full control? No, so I think, I think the good news is I think account aggregators finally, I think COVID delayed things, but I think account aggregator as a concept is starting to come of age. Uh, I think I think we will finally see regulated entities be able to use infra like Aadhaar and EKYC sooner than we imagine. Uh, I think the dust has settled at least on KYC, which is a very big enabling factor. The dust has settled on the account aggregator model. So the regulators are well within their rights to say banks must give the consumer's data to the consumer when they demand it. I think the building blocks and plays. Let's look at the last piece, which is Will businesses follow? It's all fine and dandy to say everyone can use this. Does anyone want to, right? I think that's where you're going to. I think, I think it'll happen. I think it'll happen with or without zero MDR for a different reason. I don't think insurance penetration, stock broking, banking, lending, all of these categories. I don't think the business model for those categories was ever dependent on whether you have a payments business or not in the first place. I actually think that assuming that if you are a great payments company, you'll also be great at the others is, is again foolish. If data were, were making people very, very successful on these, in these business models, everybody would be in 10 categories simultaneously, even in the old guard. That's not true. Yeah. So I think, I think access to data through account aggregator will open up. I'm, I'm pretty bullish on that. We've applied for it. We are waiting for our final license. Uh, I think access to infrastructure like EKYC that will really make it easy and open up the funnel will open up. I think India's core public-private partnership model still works really, really well. I think the Aadhaar Supreme Court case did rattle it and challenge the way it was being designed. And I think some correction happened in, in the consumer's interest, by the way. I think, I think the privacy model was required. Uh, I think, I think the risk is actually not on that side. I think the risk is political. I think the risk is that we are also entering an environment globally where regulators and governments are trying to say, I need access to that data for governance as well, right? Their promised land is they have access to that data as well. Well, how much data will you give to a private company even with or without consent and how much will you give to the government? I think that is the yeah. next 10 year flashpoint. 
I don't think a private company in a regulated space like payments or banking or any of these sectors will be able to, even with consent, in a way the way they want to, if there's a risk that the data that they're collecting can be can be secured by the government just freely. I think we need to find the right balance. No, I, you know, one of the things that I was, uh, that I'm always thankful for is how thoughtful some of you guys who are actually building this are and how you're thinking at a systemic level uh, versus just thinking about about yourself. So appreciate it and, and thank you. Uh, l last set of qu questions. Um, you're, you've always got this ability to see the future uh, in a way that most people don't. So if you had to start one or two companies around payments, fintech, transactional ecosystems, what would those be? Hmm. Banking for sure. I think banking will look very, very different in 10 years from here again. Again, you're seeing all of those early sort of Delta four changes happening, right? Regulators demanding unbundling, demanding democratization and, and, and you're hearing the government saying penetration is not good enough, products not reaching people. And you're hearing a whole bunch of 25 year old kids saying, I can build this better. I think, I think there's a tsunami coming there. So I think banking is one. Uh, if I was 15 years younger, I would have entered lending today. Uh, and the reason I say that is slightly different. I think lending is not just about building great platforms. I think it's also about a lot of risk taking with, in India, no collections model. This is not the US. You don't have a credit bureau where your lights will get shut off because you didn't pay a credit card bill because you were on vacation. You get penalized bad. You can't get a house loan if you default on a car loan and so on. Here, what's the punishment? If there's no punishment to do unsecured flow-based lending, which I think that's the only part of the entire India stack story as well, uh, where we've always had a different point of view, I think is the right answer for India. But I think the legal system needs to tighten up. If it does, and I'm willing to give it 20 years to transform, if I'm 25 again, 25 year old me right now in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. Awesome. Uh, so, Samir, firstly, thank you for joining us. This has just uh, been an awesome candid chat. Anything that you wanted to share and sort of final thoughts from you? No, thank you. Uh, always, always a pleasure chatting you with you, Vikram. And uh, I think final thoughts are, it's an absolutely amazing time to be in the tech industry in India. Uh, what excites me the most, uh, and I'm too old to benefit from it, but I think there's the right kind of capital. There's long patient capital in India. I think founders today are able to make outsized bets and still hold on to enough equity, like in the Bay where they'll be in the driver's seat longer. So I think, I think we are starting to see startups, which are, going to actually become long sustainable companies, not just exit worthy startups. I think that for me is the big thing I'm seeing, right? It's not the unicorn every day. It's the fact that there are 50 sectors in which people are saying, I'm going to, I'm going to really, really transform India. And I, I think they have the patience to do it, which is, which is super exciting. So good time to be there. You know, I'm super excited about the breadth of companies that are getting created and disrupting pretty much every industry in India. So on that note, thank you for the, for the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Vikram. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in. For more Matrix Moments episodes, you can head to www.matrixpartners.in slash blog. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more updates.